um, I felt like maybe playing this or trying to play this worship song. It's one of my very favorites. I was thinking as we were singing that song, um, the longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. And he really does. But every day just is not always heaven. <laughs> and sometimes you sing through songs and you think, well, that's not quite right, Mike, because all of us face life. But I am just so thankful that I have him, that I know he's there, even when it doesn't seem like maybe the path is as clear as we would love it to be. We just know he's there and he cares and he is so intimately involved in our lives when we let him be. He created us and um, I know I was telling Adrian this week, honey, he loves you more than you know. And he understands what goes on in our bodies. We don't always know. And sometimes it gets real confusing. But I'm so glad that he loves us. And more and more, I have been reminded that he is, how does the scripture go that says, God inhabits praise? And even in our darkest hour, we can praise him. And I love this worship song. It's page 72, if you don't know the words to it.
Do we exalt him? That's a stand up, raise your hand song. It's just the way it is. <laughs> Praise his name. Well, it's good to be with you. Uh, it might be better in a few minutes when my part's done, but uh, good to see you all again. It was in the news, not the major headlines, but it was in the news this week. A girl named Shamima Began used to be a, a citizen of the United Kingdom. She is in a refugee camp in Syria. As far as I know, that's where she is now. And she was trying to get them to allow her, her citizenship back to the United Kingdom. This girl in 2015, along with two other girls, had fooled their parents and got tickets. They had been groomed by the ISIS fighters over in Syria online, and uh, they t got them uh, tickets and a way to get out of England and uh, to go over to Syria. Thank you, Sugar. To join the ISIS caliphate. The caliphate was, uh, ISIS is broke up today, but the caliphate was a thing back then. And so, she went over there. She was getting ready to have her third child. She had lost two already. And uh, she wanted desperately to get her citizenship back to England and get back home to have this baby. The United Kingdom, Britain, denied her her citizenship. As far as I know, the baby is been lost by this time. Anyway, that got me thinking about citizenship for heaven. You know, this girl could have some sort of a life, not as good as she wants, possibly, uh, without citizenship in England. I'm glad I'm a citizen of the United States still. It's uh, got some problems, but I'm thankful for my citizenship. But I tell you what, folks, there's one place I want to be a citizen of, and that is heaven, the kingdom of God. Excuse me. My throat's going to work on me, I'm afraid, today. What is the kingdom of heaven? Let's look at uh, Matthew chapter 6 and the Lord's Prayer. Jesus taught his disciples after this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You notice that word kingdom is in there twice in this, what we call the Lord's Prayer. And uh, so let's take a look at uh, some of the th uh, other scriptures in the Bible about the kingdom of heaven. God has had a plan for his kingdom to be on this earth since before creation, and he is still working on that plan. It is coming to fulfillment. It's as sure, folks, as if it was already here. It's as sure as if you stepped outside of this building and, uh, you know, it talks about holiness being on the pots and the pans and on the all, if you stepped outside and the world was like that, the, what's coming is as sure as if it was already here. Why? Because he said so. There's some words that the Bible uses, our uh, English translation. Rule, dominion, kingdom, 
scepter, and throne. And those all have to do with uh, uh, the kingdom, and they're all used about the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. Um, I want to say this. If we step outside like I was talking about and uh, go to the first building that has people around it and if you get involved in what's going on there in a conversation you will realize right away the kingdom of heaven is not visible here yet but parallel to what we're living in there is an unseen kingdom a spiritual kingdom that runs parallel to this one that's absolutely real than this one god Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, rule in that kingdom of heaven, and they are working today in this earth. The kingdom is coming. Um, I mentioned Adrian. I, I'll tell you this story a few years ago. The same year we lost Tyra, uh, Adrian and her, her kids and her husband was over to our place, and they were getting back home. They were needed to go back to Fordland, so they were trying to leave in the afternoon, and there was a storm brewing. So they stopped. They stopped at Aldemont to uh, one of Anthony's cousins that lives there and just delayed, trying to let the storm get through. Uh, Drew graduated from high school, or from grade school, eighth grade that year. Um, we were at baccalaureate. Baccalaureate had just finished, I believe, the service had. And I was at the back of the church, and my phone rang, or vibrated. And uh, Adrian was on the line, and she said, Dad, we're over here going through Joplin. He said, well, you cannot believe what's going on. There's trucks laid over on the road everywhere. Well, <laughs> I comprehended what was going on pretty quick. I said, you have arrived at that tornado scene just as the tornado had went on through and they haven't got the road closed yet. But she said there was trucks off everywhere. A couple of years ago, Natalie gave us a picture of a minivan, somebody that she had had paint this thing, this minivan, flying down the road, and this angel stretched out over top of it. And uh, what am I talking about? The unseen world. They were in the path of that storm and God just hesitated everything just enough. Now, God doesn't do anything wrong or doesn't allow anything that uh, he hasn't said okay to. A few months later, we lost Tyra and uh, God is still good. I still wanna be a part of the kingdom of heaven. So, with this in mind, let's look at some other scriptures. The Holy Trinity created earth so man could rule it under their direction. In Genesis 1 and 26, God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion, a kingdom word, over the fish of the air, over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, over the cattle and over all the earth every creeping thing that creepeth on the earth. And God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and every living thing, repeating 26 there in 28. And that word dominion is a kingdom word. What happened? Man failed to heed God's command. They listened to the serpent, and they lost their standing there in the earth, and they allowed Satan to claim authority 
Why would God allow that to happen? Because he has a plan, and it's as sure as if it was already here. In Matthew chapter 4, Satan is um, tempting Jesus, and Satan claims ownership of the kingdoms of this earth. Listen to what he says. The devil taketh him up to an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he said to him, I will give you all these things if you'll just fall down and worship me. Jesus answered him with the word of God, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shall, thou, thy, thy, shall you serve. Jesus is going to set up the kingdom of heaven on earth, but not Satan's way. I'm going to reiterate this again. The kingdom of heaven is influencing the kingdom that's coming to this earth, and it's as sure as if it was already here. God works with Abraham, and he said to Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, and to a land I will show thee. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless thee, make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, curse them that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. That is a prophecy about Jesus Christ who is going to sit on the throne of David. Let's look at David, the shepherd boy, for a minute. The kingdom started out in the tribe of Benjamin, but Saul failed in, in obeying God, so David has been anointed to be king. Um, clear back in Jacob's day, Jacob as an old man blessed his son Judah with this blessing. Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise, thy hand shall be upon the neck of thy enemies, Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp, or a small lion. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down, he crouched as a lion, as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? Here's the prophecy about Jesus. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh, or peace, come and unto him shall be the gathering of the people. King David starts the fulfillment of this prophecy, and Jesus is the fulfillment. Think about David after he's anointed. He goes down and gets into the skirmish with giant, the giant Goliath, becomes acquainted with Saul, goes out as a soldier for Saul and for the army, and uh, it isn't too long before he's running through the hills and the rocks and the countryside running for his life for around 10 years probably. I wonder what he thought around the campfire at night with his men when he thought back to that anointing where Samuel anointed him and he's running for his life. It's as sure as if it's already there. The kingdom, his kingdom is coming. After Saul's death, David does become king. In 2 Samuel 5, 4, at the age of 30, and he reigns for 40 years, seven and a half over just Judah and possibly Benjamin, and then he becomes king over all of Israel, all 12 tribes for another 23 or 33 years. And this is what Nathan the prophet says to David. David has a desire to build the Lord's house. And Nathan at first tells him to go ahead and then he, God speaks to him. And this is what God tells Nathan to tell David. And when thy days, David, shall be fulfilled and you shall sleep with the, your fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build an house for my name, talking about Solomon, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, he shall be my son, 
If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And God never messes a detail of his promise. And thy house, thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. And according to these words, and according to all this vision, did Nathan speak unto David. Notice the words forever repeated. Jesus will be the fulfillment of all God promised about a king on the throne of David forever. Let's look at uh, Elijah's day, the prophet. You remember uh, Elijah comes to the king, to King Ahab, steps up into the uh, throne room there before the king, and he says, O king, it's not going to rain till I say so. And he turned around and he left. Do you think that they probably was some laughter after that old prophet walked out the door? It probably was. And uh, three and a half years later, nobody's laughing. Everybody's looking for Elijah. Elijah meets the prophets of Baal. Ahab and Jezebel meets them up on Mount Carmel. And there's this great showdown. And God answered by fire on that altar, licked up the wood, the water, the sacrifice, everything. A tremendous victory for God and for the kingdom of Israel. Jezebel sends a message to Elijah and she says, I'm coming after you and I'm gonna do to you what you did to them. I don't know why you know, you'd have thought after all he saw on the mountain with the power of God that his faith would have been a little bigger. This woman must have really been scary because he takes off. And on Mount Horeb, God feeds him on the way, gets him there, and the big show with the wind and the, and the weather, all of that happened, and uh, God hadn't spoke to Elijah yet, but finally God comes and talks to him, and Elijah says, Lord, you just will take me, because after all of this, she's still coming after me, and uh, uh, nobody else cares, Lord. Nobody else is involved. Remember what the Lord said to him? Let's look. And so it was, when Elijah heard, he wrapped his face in his mantle, went out and stood in the entering of the cave. Behold, there came a voice and said, What doest you, Elijah? He said, I've been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thy altars, slain thy prophets, and I, even only I, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Shook God up pretty bad, didn't it? Listen to what the Lord says. Go return to the, by the way of the wilderness to Damascus. When you come, anoint Hazel that be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shall thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elijah, the son of Shaphat of Abel-Meholah, shall thou anoint to be prophet in thy room or in thy stead. And it shall come to pass that, that him that escapeth the sword of Hazel shall Jehu slay. Him that escapeth the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. Elijah, by the way, I have 7,000 left. All the knees that have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. Elijah. The kingdom of heaven is still going. The kingdom that's coming to earth, it's still going. Don't worry about it. You can come home, and Elijah goes home to meet the Lord in a fiery chariot. Let's look at Daniel the prophet. This is, to me, one of the most powerful uh, 
scriptures about the kingdom of heaven. Um, see whether God's people are doing what they're supposed to do all the time or not, God is still marching on in his bringing the kingdom to pass to this earth. Daniel is one of those young men that was taken in and taken back to Babylon when Jerusalem was conquered. I don't know how many times uh, they came back to Jerusalem four or five times and took more people captive, many times. But the, uh, the idea was to take the best, the brightest of the young people from Israel back to Babylon, retrain them, uh, brainwash them to being like Chaldeans, and then probably take them back to their countryside and change them from being followers of the God of Israel to the gods of Babylon. Daniel and the three Hebrew boys were a problem for that. So they're in exile. They're not in their own kingdom. And Nebuchadnezzar is the king at this point. And so Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, and he's real worried about it. He doesn't remember it, but he knows it's significant, so he starts asking for people to come in and explain the dream to him. They said, well, you tell us the dream, and we'll give you the interpretation. He said, oh, no, you don't. He said, you'll tell me whatever you think it is if I tell you the dream. But if you can tell me what I dreamed, then I know you can tell me the truth about what it's supposed to be. So Daniel comes, finally hears about this, and he, uh, God comes to him in the night and reveals to him what's going on, and Daniel goes before King Nebuchadnezzar. That's kind of a brief summary. And as we, you remember it was a statue, a huge thing, head of gold, shoulders of bronze, um, and then the iron, and down at the bottom was the feet of iron and clay. And uh, it's the different kingdoms of the world from Nebuchadnezzar's time down to the Roman Empire. And then it says there was a little stone in the mountain that was kind of cut out. And it comes rolling down the mountain to this image, and it breaks the image completely up. And so now in the interpretation of that, uh, Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar, in the days of these kings of the statue, the head of gold, the bronze, and all of that, in those days, this is what he said is going to happen. In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it will break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as you saw the stone that was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king, to you, king, what shall come to pass hereafter. And I like this part. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof is sure. And Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face and worshiped Daniel and, and said, Truly your God is a God of gods. Yeah. Folks, that stone has already been cut out of the mountain. Jesus Christ has come. Yeah. His visible kingdom is not where you can step out and see it. It's coming. <laughs> it is as sure as if it was already here. So now let's see how the stone does when he came. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. <laughs> Jesus, in Matthew 10, sends his disciples out to preach the kingdom. He says, go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Don't go to the outsiders. And as you go, pray, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you have received, freely give. Luke 17, the disciples, or pardon me, the Pharisees are after the disciples and Jesus. It says, and when he, Jesus, was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom should come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of heaven doesn't come with observation. In other words, you can't walk around and see, we're not building a new building. We're not uh, calling an army into existence. It's not a visible thing. But here's what it is. Neither shall they say, lo here, lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Do you know that? According to the scripture, if you know Jesus Christ, you're carrying the kingdom around in your heart. One of these days, that trumpet's going to sound. The armies of heaven are going to ride out. Everything's going to fall into place. You can uh, stand shoulder to shoulder with the rest of the uh, saved and redeemed of the universe, and the kingdom will be here on earth. It's coming. Praise God. There's a lot of parables in the New Testament I call them like snapshots at a wedding. Why do they have that photographer running around at a wedding? Uh, some of you wonder. Now, when Vash and I got married, it was, it was a pretty poor deal compared to what they do now. I don't know how much my last granddaughter spent on pictures when she and uh, Sam got married. But uh, I'm pretty sure I could fund uh, my living for a few months. <laughs> I didn't give you a, I didn't give you a price, but anyway. <laughs> but why do they do that? They take those snapshots and those pictures because they want memories. Yeah. Oh yeah, I remember this. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know he wore that that day. Whatever. <laughs> so you know how it goes. It's memories. And there's a lot of, uh, and the kingdom of heaven is like parables in the New Testament. And they're snapshots that will give you information about what this kingdom's going to be like. One of them is about pearls. One's about the wedding feast for his son. And uh, remember when there was another one about the labors where the good men of the farm went out and hired labors different times of the day. That's a kingdom parable. Uh, the mustard seed. There's another one about the draw net and the fishes. I don't know how many there are. I don't have time to go through them. But uh, those are all snapshots of the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom that's coming. The kingdom that started already and is going to be fully revealed one of these days. Revelation 12. I heard a loud voice saying, now is, now is come salvation, strength, and the kingdom of our God, the power of his Christ, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. It's happening, folks. It's coming. Revelation 11, the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. He shall reign till 2025. Huh? Forever. <laughs> Forever. And the four and 20 elders fell down which sat before God on their seats and worshiped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come. King James is hard sometimes. Because they, thou hast taken to thee, thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. Who's going to reign with him? The saints will reign with Christ, 2 Timothy 2. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall live with him. 
If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. And if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. There's some things we need to do to be ready to be in the kingdom. If you don't know Jesus, repent. He'll save you from your sins. Follow Christ with all humility. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's humility. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Be a witness for Jesus. Keep the commandments of Jesus. It says, Whosoever shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And who shall receive one of these little children in my name receiveth me. Okay, as we, as we close with this, let me uh, share this with you. Therefore take no thought what you will eat, what we shall drink, or wherewithal we shall be clothed. For these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have needed them. But seek first what? Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added. One last uh, re uh, scripture in Revelation 19 and 16, not 16, 19, verse 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. He that sat upon it was called Faithful and True. In righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire. On his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. His name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. He hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings, <laughs> and Lord of Lords. <laughs> Thy kingdom come. Seek Jesus' kingdom, for his is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.